I just wanted to pray in tongues for a bit, just for about two minutes, just pray in your language of the Spirit. And if you don't have your language of the Spirit, pray that this evening you will have your language of the Spirit. Kebaro sande la koshet hande la kwasena manto sotori kasata. Rando shegedem baro sonde li kato sotorianta. Reko shatanda la kobani kazate la kos. Rende kila kobande la koshada benda kos. Rande kos sedele kede bakomanas. Rento sketande la kosataya for Lord. This is not just another evening that we gather. Rando so gedebadosa, but every time that we gather, we gather for you. Manto sete kepanakaswate. So let your spirit flow in this place today. Manto so koranda bakas. Reko so torodo shakatela kopania sataya. Renko kopando kosede kinamo satenda kalia. That it is encounters individually and collectively with you manto sede rendo kopanande katelia komania sitenda rando sonemanda kati sepaya rendo sonenena kosa i yield we yield i yield we yield we yield our hearts i yield myself manto sande banwa sete rento sokotandi alakaya rendo sinemanda kianos let us understand the importance of the season that we are in and of the things that you are sowing into us, oh God, and let our hearts be hearts that soak in your word, that receive your word, that keep your word, that understand your word, and that cause it to bear fruit 30, 60, and a hundredfold. Spirit of the sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. Let the way Thank you for I speak as your oracle. I speak as your vessel. Thank you for prophetic insight and accuracy. Thank you for the, my words come forth in the simplicity of the spirit and in power. Thank you for it falls on hearts that you have prepared on good soil that will receive this word and we all bear fruit a hundredfold in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening once again. Woo! Sharing the word of God is a huge responsibility that I have come to really fear in the last couple of months. So the Lord will guide us this evening. Pastor has been teaching us about working in the supernatural. And in the last couple of weeks, teaching us about beholding. And this evening, I'm going to share as the Lord has led in my own deeper understanding and learning of it. Because it is indeed the key to everything. And... Let me share this example. How many of us, you know, you leave church on Sunday, you know, you hear that word, and you're like, this week, nothing can shake me. I'm going to be old. <laughs> In fact, if any devil comes, eh, I will be old. I will speak. I will confess. Then let's say by Monday afternoon, something got you. You could not open your mouth. You could not be old. In fact, Monday afternoon, for some people, Sunday evening. In fact, Sunday 2 o'clock. Am I the only one that struggles with this? Let me have witnesses, just so I know. I, oh, praise the Lord. So I just want to know that it's all of us that this happens to. Because, you know, some Sundays you leave church and like, ah, the devil is in trouble. You did not know that it was looking at you. Tony, I'm waiting. You know,
know, I think it was last week. By Tuesday, I said, God, but they told me behold. And I know it's not like I don't know the word to behold. But just that energy, it was hard. So this lesson on beholding, it's a difficult thing. Christianity is a difficult thing. That's the, that's the long and short of the matter, right? Walking the way of God because it is so counterculture and it's so different is a difficult thing. So I think that sometimes when we first understand that what we are called to is a high calling, it's easier when you face those moments when you're like, okay, this is the time to manifest the highness of the calling. You know, there are some seasons where walking with God is easy. There are some seasons where it's hard. And I've come to understand and realize that the seasons when it's hard is when your manifestation is closest. So that is why the enemy also hits you. Because he sees that, ah, she's on the edge of victory. And that's the exact time when you also felt you were going to give it everything. But somehow, that's why the Bible says, may we not lose strength in the day of adversity. But in the name of Jesus, we won't lose it. When we understand that we have a foe, an enemy who knows how to distract, deceive, and deter us. And when we understand that we just have natural life and living that can just be hard. So those two things, sometimes it's not the devil, it's just life. Then it's life and the devil. So when we understand those two things, I think it's easier for us to fight. And let's start from the book of James. You know... Pastor uses this scripture a lot. James chapter 1, verse 21 to 25, where it says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word. It is already planted. Then he says again, receive. It is already planted. Please stay on the scripture. Which is able to save your soul. The next verse but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Every time I read this scripture, I actually sometimes try to imagine myself without looking at a mirror. Because it sounds almost unbelievable that you can forget what you look like. But I don't know if you've ever tried it. There are times I'm actually trying to imagine who I look like. And I don't really get the image. Maybe some of you are perfect at imagining yourselves. Right? Because it's weird to me that you look at yourself in a mirror. Please stay on the word. Thank you. And immediately, like I look into the mirror now. And I turn back and I've forgotten what I look like. It's quite amazing. Next verse. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. The grace that we need to pray every day, God help me continue looking into your word. There are days you can go for five hours. And there are days after that you don't go for five days. So one of the major issues with us is consistency. It's just the consistency. It's to have that regimen that you say, no matter how busy it gets, no matter the mail you got at 10 p.m. the night before, and all of a sudden you now have to wake up as early as 3 a.m., you know that whatever the case, you are going to give God time. And people of God, at this phase that we are, time is not 15 minutes. Time gone is not 30 minutes. You can break it at different points of the day. But the Bible says the measure of thought and study that we give is the measure of virtue that we bring out of it that continues to look into it. And James said that thing as a warning. It's, it's actually not like an advice or like a comfort or an encouragement. It's like a warning. You must continue. You must continue. So many times what we try to do is we are trying to do the word. He said the doer is not him that is trying to do. The doer is the one that continues looking. 
But we put the energy on trying to do. You are trying to manifest. You are trying to perform. And God says, I'm not asking you to try to do. I'm saying, look, this book of the law shall not depart from your eyes, from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. And as you do, you observe to do all that is written in it. And therein, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. He told Joshua, you are going to possess the land. I'm not asking you to try now to go and possess the land. I'm asking you to look. It's as simple as it sounds difficult. And that's sometimes the irony of Christianity. That it seems it's hard, but it's actually simple. But in that simplicity, it's like it's hard. Yes, even what I said. It's like it's hard and it's simple. That's how it looks. Because he told him, all I need you to do, Joshua, continue to look. I have given you the promise. Meditate day and night. And if you read all the conquests of Joshua, half of the time they do not even really fight. They will get there. They will say they sent hailstones from heaven. They will get there. Number one, grace. Just every day, God, the grace to continue. The grace to continue. It's a prayer point. Like you leave church and say, God, these things I've heard. The grace to even go back and read my notes is a prayer point. So let's establish that first. And now let's go to 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. My message is somewhere in between those two verses, those two books. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. I just wanted to reestablish the beholding and the fact that you have to continue. You have to continue. Ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me start from chapter 3, verse 1. For me, even for me, this is a bit of a technical, you know, the letters of Paul, like Peter said, they are a bit hard. But the Lord brought me to the letters of Paul. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? I'm reading 2 Corinthians 3, 1 NLT. Or do we need as others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of the Spirit, Christ. You are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So, pastor has been teaching us to behold and I find that, well, let me say for me, I'm, it's like I'm trying to behold a result on the outside, right? So you are trying to behold this prayer point, you are praying, your promises for 2024, and what you are really trying to behold is what that result is, or how that result will be, or how shall these things be? Just follow me. But one of the things that God is teaching me is that this beholding is not necessarily first to change the things on the outside, but to change the heart. That when he says, come and behold and stay with this word, what I want to change is your heart. And so he says in 2 Corinthians um, 3.3, 3, clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with the ink, but by the spirit of the living God. Not on the tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. God is saying, what I'm really trying to get you to focus on is there's a work in your heart I need to do. And when that work in your heart is done, what you are trying to manifest on the outside will flow as a function of the heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? But because, you see... When we, we have to have proper understanding as to what we are chasing so that we are chasing the right thing. Because there's no point running a marathon like all these marathons they run. For, you know, one sprint is easy. You run a marathon, but you're 80 kilometers, all those things. You run Third Milan Bridge, the Slim Stadium. You now get to the end. They say, ah, this is the wrong route. <laughs> Even if you were first, the fact that it's the wrong route is the wrong route. So you have to understand what exactly are we meant so that you don't spend months beholding. Then, like, ah, this thing is not working. This thing is not. 
So the first thing he wants to do is the heart. Because we have a new covenant that is at work with us. When he spoke here, he said, clearly, you are not the one that was written on tablets of stone. Moses went up for 40 days. And the importance of the 40 days that we did, I'll get to it, highly prophetic. Moses went up for 40 days and God gave him tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And that is what we worked with and worked with and worked with until Jesus came and changed it. But even from the days of Jeremiah, the prophecy was given. And it says in Jeremiah 31, 33, but this is the new covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. Deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So the work of beholding that God has called us to, let me change you on the inside. I truly believe the journey of the Israelites was meant to be officially 11 days. Officially. The journey, if you read Deuteronomy 1, it says the journey from Kanesh Banir to somebody somewhere was, for, was 11 days, right? But it took them 40 years. But God had even said he would not let them do this 11 days. That he wanted them to do 40 days so that he would test what was in their hearts. And I believe that the work of that 40 days was not just to test, but was to change what was in their hearts. Because people of God, when you are in captivity for years, there is no way you will not be programmed. There is no way you will not be programmed. So when you have come out of a family, maybe the average age of everybody here, okay, let's say 18. 18 years of programming programs you. And depending on the kind of family, experience, background, whatever you've had, whatever you've suffered in life, when you come into Jesus, the first work is to unprogram that program. Not to see him as your ATM card or your miracle worker. Because miracle working an ATM card is not hard. That's what he does by default. So the first work he says is, let me change your heart. Let me get you to know who I am. In knowing who I am, I'll reprogram you to who you are. So that 40 days of the Israelites was, you've come out of the Red Sea. Then get to the bitter waters. Then remember that, ah, the Lord that did the Red Sea, can you not do the bitter waters? So every challenge was a faith adventure to know God. But unfortunately for them, they didn't get it. And many of us are like that. You've just come out of a miracle and you get to the next one. <laughs> But God, where are you? You are forsaking me. And he's like, remember where you are coming from. And let me show you another level of me. Another dimension of me. Another level of my glory. Let me let you understand who I am. So even the 40 days that we went through, I know that some people tied all their destiny to that 40 days. It was a precursor for things to come. It wasn't the end. So we finished fasting on February 23. It wasn't the end. It was just the beginning. That God used it to say, I am now preparing you for the journey of 2024. So the miracles, the, no, sorry, the promises, the prophecies, the revelation, the word he gave you is to enter a challenge and say, ah, you told me on day 17. Then you go back to the scripture on day 17, you behold. So it's not to say, ah, but God, we finished fasting 40 days. Why am I facing this challenge? That's why you are facing the challenge. Because when Jesus finished fasting 40 days, he was about to enter his glory. And Satan said, no, I'll get you. So for some of you that maybe you've been really tempted in the last two weeks, it's because you fasted. So, you know, we always think it's the other way around. Because I fasted, challenges mustn't come. Because I prayed, this mustn't happen. Because you did, it must happen. So we will see the power that you received and how you execute it. Every time that you pray, every time that you wait, it is to receive power to use. There is power generation, there is power distribution. So every time that you come to church, you have generated power. You pray in the morning, you have generated power. You read the word. So if you don't want to distribute it, what are we doing? It says, I'm beholding you not to change something on the outside, but to become someone on the inside. He says, I am beholding you to walk in the righteousness of God. I am beholding you to become like God. I am beholding you to see the glory. If we continue in that scripture, 2 Corinthians 3 from verses 4. He said, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. 
Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of this new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Once again, it's not a do, 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 but a B, 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 a relationship, a fellowship. It's not a, rule, a, a set of laws. He says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was so glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. We are in the ministry of righteousness righteousness and our righteousness is Jesus he's not he's not saying ah Twain do not pray five hours this morning but he's looking at you to say you have the spirit released to you by that power wait with me it's not laws it is a relationship where we are even already empowered by the person we are relating with to walk with him he says for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. You see, the glory of the lives, in fact, I've had to be repenting lately because I say it's like I do not, I've not been really knowing the depth of this life. Like we are seeing issues on the outside and you are thinking that you are called to complain. No, you are called to manifest glory. Pastor said something so powerful on Sunday that he has made a demand that he must do something nobody has done. Did we hear that? Do you know what that is? Like, I, if I, when he said it, I thought to myself, what has nobody done? But there is something nobody has done. Is it not when the internet came? It's when the AI came. There is still something that will come in two years. There's still something that will come in five years. There's still something that will come in ten years. We have to live consumer mentality. We are the manifestation of the sons of God. But we cannot live it if we don't walk in that consciousness. That there is a glory that is glorious. He says, therefore, since we have such hope, verses 12, we use great boldness of speech. The child of God has to be bold. And you see that boldness of speech, you have nothing. You are talking as if you are the king of kings. Because technically you are the king of kings though. The king of kings lives in you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Pastor shared a scripture on, on Sunday. That, that message blew my mind. That scripture, I have held it. It's like I've not seen it before. He says... Ah, I'm, I'm jumping, but it's okay. Time two is going. Isaiah 52, verses 13. From verses 13 to 15, and I'll just quickly read it. He said, see, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he hardly seemed human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. This same person will startle many nations. He says kings will stand speechless in his presence. When I saw that scripture on Sunday, I literally imagined me standing before a king. At least there's one king we know in the world now, Sha. And he's standing speechless in my presence. Do you understand? Presidents will stand speechless in your presence. CEOs will stand speechless in your presence. You take this kind of scriptures, you chew it, boldness of speech. It will sound crazy to you when you are saying it because even rats is running, it's not standing speechless in your presence. Right? Right? So when you say it, even you are thinking which king is going to say it until it rewires your brain. That is why I said beholding is to change the inside. I'm not trying to go out now and stand before a king and say, oh yeah, stand speechless in my presence. If they will use broom, auntie, who are you? But when he changes me on the inside, and as he's changing you in faith, actions, leadings begin from, it might be a prophecy of five years, it might be a prophecy of ten years, it might be a prophecy of two years, it might be a prophecy of six months. 
But my work is not to try to say, oh yeah, where is the king? Now maybe, you know, you have a contract. You've been looking for the CEO of a company. You now say, ah, kings will stand speechless in my presence. You just go to the company. I want to see the CEO. They will chase you. But stay with the word he has given you. Look at that proposal. Make sure with the Holy Spirit is the right thing. Begin to declare. Look at the word. Behold. The MD will give me, will give me favor. This one will stand speechless in my presence. Make it until you know that on the inside, you yourself see yourself as someone that they are standing speechless in their presence. So when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we make bold speeches. That's who we are. We are still going to get to verse 4. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of God could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in who? People of God, you cannot manifest without a relationship. And many of us want to have a form of godliness. So we really just come to God for the power. The veil is taken away in Christ. You must want to know Jesus. You must want to follow Jesus. You must want to sacrifice for Jesus. We don't like those ones. You must want to suffer as Jesus suffered. Before kings will stand in your presence, you will suffer. And it's not a curse. It's just, and that suffering, don't worry, you'll be okay. Right? But these things, we are still getting to chapter 4. These things will happen. So you cannot want it without Christ. The veil is taken away in Christ. Pastor keeps saying, pray that you, the eyes of your, of your understanding are lightened. Pray that you have eyes that see, that you have ears that hear. It is taken away in Christ. Verse 15, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord... Repeating it once again, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. The transformation is inside. You, you have to understand that. The transformation is inside, and the transformation is becoming like God. The transformation is becoming like God. The transformation is becoming like God. God is calling us back to his original plan. Where was his original plan? Genesis 1. What did he say? Let us make man in what? In our image. What does he say here? We are being transformed into the same image. He's calling us back to the original plan before Adam fell. That the sending of Jesus was that you can see me in flesh and understand how Jesus lived and understand how you can live and even much more. See, when we read the Bible, you should just be saying, God, it's like I'm falling in your hand. You are not the one to be crying victim. We are victors. We are more than conquerors. We are overcomers. You should see the things happening and be like, what is the opportunity here? Open my eyes, Lord. What am I meant to be creating? What am I meant to be doing? Which industry do I need to enter now to be the solution? Not say, ah, the this is this, the that is that. That's not our culture. He says the, the creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. So some people are even looking at us and wondering, these church people, what are they doing? That's what pastor is saying. This is who we have been made to be. So these times, these times is for your rising. But it's not something that you hear and you just get excited. 
Because the rising is not going to be without pressing in. Pressing in to God. Pressing in. You have issues and you're able to suspend your issues because you know there is a bigger picture. Hmm. He says here, I am calling you to an understanding so you know I made you the manifesto. You are not here to seek the manifestation. You are here to create the manifestation. So you are not here to say, God, I am waiting on you. You are here to say, God, what is it that you have prepared for such a time as this that we will do together? Because there is a reason why I'm in Nigeria, I'm in UK, I'm wherever I am, wherever you are watching this from, there is a reason why I am in this land for such a time as this. Let's open to Romans 8.19. Romans 8.19. It says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, that means I'm reading another, another translation. Maybe it's NLT or something. Like I said, I have many translations. But I really liked that in us. Because once again, it buttresses the point. The glory is first within. He came to Mary. He said, oh, the virgin will have a child. She said, how shall these things be? Simple. The spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The power of the most high will overshadow you. There was, it wasn't anything, ah, then you now wait. Then you now go. Then, he now said, to boost your faith, go and see Elizabeth. Why? Elizabeth was old. Elizabeth was almost like a Sarah. So for Elizabeth to have conceived, Mary knew the impossible was possible. God will not leave you without evidence. God does not leave us without evidence. So when he's calling you to do crazy things, some of the evidence, he'll give you the word. Some of the evidence, he'll say, Jeremiah, what do you see? Toyin, what do you see? Ah, may God open our eyes to see. That every spirit of blindness I curse in the name of Jesus. Hmm. So you know that what we are pursuing is a beholding to transform with him. To really know and become like him. The prayer of Paul in Ephesians 1.17. Many times, you know, we get carried away by um, the eyes of understanding and enlightened. Know the hope of his calling. But the first prayer, the very first prayer was that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That was the first prayer. So to get to the eyes of your understanding and enlightened, it is first the knowledge of him. Children of God, we must pursue the knowledge of God. We must, this beholding is the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him, we receive the knowledge of us. Let's go to Second Corinthians. Let's go to uh, chapter 4. Now I need to rush. So in chapter 4, verses 1, he then says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, that's the ministry of the new covenant, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, trying to use it to do a EJ, yo, J, it's my dream, it's my dream. There's no time for that. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He then says, but even if the gospel is veiled, because I know that so some people is still veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. That is not our portion. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Unbelief. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is God, verse 6, who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Who are shone in where? Goes back there. He has shone in our hearts to give the light of what? The knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus it is an inner work. It is to know God. You have to get what we are chasing right. It is the light that has shone in our hearts. 
The light will shine on the inside of you. And it is an inner work. It is for the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus. So once more, is to know Jesus, to know God, to change inside, to manifest outside. We have to be chasing the right thing. And this matter of the heart is very deep. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your what? There is one of the translations that says, for it determines the course of your life. When I read that translation, I now look at my life. I say, ah, so is it my heart producing my life? So that you're not blaming anybody on the outside. You cannot even blame your father, your mother, your sister, your this. It says your heart determines the course of your life. So as our lives are going, you have to look back and say, ah, that's NLT. Is it my heart producing all these things? It's a scary scripture. TPT says, so above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellspring of life. This month of March, for some of us, you just need to do a heart check. Like, you know, the way you do checkup every year, every six months. How well do you do heart check? Because life knows how to break us. Sometimes we're just going broken. We come to church broken. We are living, we are even praying broken. For some, there's so much pain. Life, 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 oh, oh deep. So for some people, different things have happened. It's not even about sharing it. Even if you share it, that can be extra problem. You know, but there are just some things that are just carrying in your heart. Weight, pains, loss, issues, failures, abuse. So many things. Rejection, betrayal. And those things do a deep work in our hearts. And the grace is... At every point in time, from time to time, you can truly go to God and say, God, I'm in pain. God is not fair. God, but I prayed for five years. God, why is this happening? And let him heal your heart. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He says, I think it's Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. You cannot live to the fullness with a broken heart. You can't. You can have a little result here, a little result there, but the fullness. And for some of us, we just need to pursue wholeness again. That regardless of what has happened, God make me whole again. Regardless of where this journey of 40 years of my life has brought me, 35 years, 46 years, 52 years has brought me, this is where we are now, oh Lord. It's okay. It's fine. Just make me whole again and show me how to continue this journey. But you cannot continue with a broken heart. You cannot put bandage on a wound that has not healed. And that's what we've perfected many times. So we're just going, we know the flow. But the wound is there getting deeper. For, so, so for some of us, we need to do a heart check. And God said here, he said, cycles and patterns don't break with time. They break with truth. Cycles and patterns don't break with time. The pain of loss does not erode with time. It is with truth. It is with light. It is with understanding. So don't say, ah, after five years, the thing will go. It will not go. If you are not actively seeking truth, light, it will just continue. And I don't know why he gave me that word cycles and patterns. Some of us are just in patterns. Patterns. Every two years is the same thing. You feel like you're making progress. You come back to that same place. The enemy knows how to deal with us with time. Can't you? Some of you, some of us, we said, ah, in 10 years, I will be. Then you look back, it's already 10 years. And I'm wondering, where did the time go? Hmm. It says, light and understanding must shine within you. Some people can be in a situation for five years and some for five months. 
So let's quickly continue um, 2 Corinthians 4. It then says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. You look so ordinary, but you carry power. Many times we want to look like the power. The culture of the kingdom, you will not look like the power. The power is God's, but the power is there. So don't don't judge yourself by how people are looking at you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He says we are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken. We are struck down but not destroyed. So some of us are only thinking of the fact that we are hard pressed, we are perplexed, we are persecuted, we are struck down. That other side you cannot even process it because the problems are much. He says, we are always carrying about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Another translation says, the suffering of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is working in us, but life in you. And God says here, the wilderness you are going through is not to break you. It is to shape you. We're going through some things and wondering, why am I perplexed? Why am I being persecuted? Why is this happening to me? It's not to break you. It has never been. Jesus came out of the wilderness. The Bible says, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. The Israelites were meant to come out of that wilderness to glory, to possess their possessions, but they didn't get it. In Luke chapter 4, verses 14, then Jesus returned to, to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. That is the result of the wilderness. It's not the other way around. Don't curse the wilderness. It says he returned to Galilee. The, the first, uh, first 1 to 13 verses is about the temptation and the 40 days fast. And at the beginning, if you look at 4 verse 1, then Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. So there's one level to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's another level to be filled with the power. Because it says here, he returned filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. No social media, no NTA, no CNN. How did it happen? The manifestation that you are looking for, it can happen like this. That business to blow, it can happen like this. That thing to sort, it can happen like this. (laughs) If we are chasing the right thing. It says here, every wilderness season is to birth in us a new level of power if worked right. And if we look at Isaiah 45, I'm already rounding up. If we look at Isaiah 45, it's just important to establish these scriptures because it's in the word that we have light. Isaiah 45, very popular scripture that we know. This is what the Lord said to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed. Verse 3, and I like how the NLT says it. I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness. Secret riches. There are treasures in the darkness. There are treasures in the darkness. I had never seen it like this before until a couple of weeks. He said treasures hidden in the darkness. So don't curse the darkness. It's out of that darkness that light comes. So for some people, your prayer is God in this darkness. Show me the treasures. There are treasures hidden in the darkness. So what do we do? Back to 2 Corinthians 4. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, it says, I believed and therefore I spoke. We are a speaking church. You must continue to have boldness of speech. He says, we also believed and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. And then we go to verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. 
Even though our outward man is perishing, even though things are happening all around, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, this is one of the most interesting scriptures in the Bible. But the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. God, how do I look at what I don't see? It's kind of like an irony. We look at the word. We look at God. We look at what God is saying. So the things which you see are easy because you can see the form, you can see the shape, you can see the person persecuting you, you can see. That is why you now need to turn the word into visualization, into images. That's how you see what you don't see. And it's not a day's job. It's not a week's job. For some people, it might not even be a month's job. Some people are very great in imaginations, visualization. Some people, in fact, it takes a while. Right? And just to establish and just to finish this, especially for someone who might be going through something now, I have been saying that God is doing a work in us. And when we are going through things, don't chase the solution of the thing. Chase God. Let me show you what I mean. Please open Psalm 27. Let's quickly learn a lesson from David. Whilst what you are seeking is the solution, remember that there is a bigger picture. David said here, the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? He then says, when evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I remain confident. What did David get here? His speech was right. Then he says, one thing I ask of the Lord, that one thing do I seek. What do you think David should have asked of the Lord? Help. The enemy should be destroyed. The enemy should die. Is that not valid? David asked of the Lord. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. The day I saw this scripture, I said, God, I'm not yet a Christian. He had all of these issues and yet he was seeking the presence. He was seeking God. And then he now tells us, for he will conceal me there when trouble comes. So I'm not seeking for him to conceal me. I know that he that is in the secret place of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. So I will not be afraid of the terror by day or something by night because I am in the presence. So my prayer is not, Lord, take away the terror, take away the... Eh, eh. He says people will fall all around you, will not come near you. So he established that what he's seeking, and we should take an example from David. And after that, all the things that will happen to his enemies will happen because he was seeking the right thing. His destination was the right place. So as we close this evening, the final thing, and I know that I can't get into this, God also says we should check our love walk. And love is not, I'm not saying man and woman love, but how we treat one another. How we truly love one another. If there is one character that God is described with, God is what? You know, the Bible actually doesn't say God is faith. It doesn't say God is power. It doesn't say God is riches. God is love. And in becoming like God, the one attribute that perfects everything is love. For God, so what? So he looked at you and me and he says, ah, regardless of how this girl is just affecting my brain, I'll still send Jesus. Until today, they are still interceding for us. Even when he looks and he says, but why is she behaving like that? But why is he behaving like that? Love. And I find that that is sometimes where we fall short the most. So we are seeking everything else, but we are missing it one to another. People will offend you. People will betray you. 
people will hurt you. But how would they know that we are disciples? The Bible says because we love the brethren. I think that is John 13, 15 or something. When he left the commands in John 17, he said, love one another. Like I said, I can't get into it today, but this love matter. In this season that we are, for some of us, the manifestation is a love test. That's it. It's a love test. To love people that are hard to love. To love people that, as you're looking at them, the thing is pinching you like this. And God says, you're going to work in love. You're going to still give. You're going to still pray. You're going to still greet. May the Lord give us wisdom. Let us stand to pray. Because after all he said and done, he said, faith that worketh in love. So we cannot just manifest faith without love. I've said different things today. I've said, number one, God is working in our hearts. He's seeking for us to become like him. We have to understand that we might always feel inadequate. But that is where the excellency of God is. Some of us are hard-pressed and you are really just trying to survive. I don't know where you are, what, which one of this touched you. Whether it's the love walk, whether it's the grace to have boldness of speech. Just bring it before God this evening and just ask him to help you. Whether it's the grace to continue. Maybe there are just a lot of distractions and so many things going on in your life. Whether it's the grace to really just know God for God. Maybe even the way that you've been seeking him. You've been more solution-minded than God-minded. And you're just like, Father, I need your help. I don't know where he's touching you this evening. But just ask him to say, it's one thing in this word you are going to take away with you. Lord, help me to be able to speak. Even when I see myself as ordinary, help me know that you have created me for the supernatural. Help me to continue in your word. And not to be moved by the things that I see on the outside. Bring yourself before God and that place that you are. And ask him for his help and his grace on this journey. On this journey, we must get it right. You must continue. You must be victorious. You must overcome. This is what God has written concerning you. And you are not going to live below it in the mighty name of Jesus. And as I close, just two things. God said there is a bosse. You are either here or you are watching online and you have a leg injury. And God says healing is flowing through your leg right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And the second one, there's someone called Daniel. You have an eye infection or an eye condition. And he says your eye is being corrected in the mighty name of Jesus. And finally, he says he's doing a heart surgery for many people who have been going through pain or something in particular. And for this, he gave a scripture. He says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. He showed me this particularly in the message translation, Proverbs 13, 12. If you can put the message translation on screen so that everybody sees it. The message says, every unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. And it said there are certain persons here who you have had continuous disappointment and your heart has become sick. And I specifically wrote it down. It said, a sudden good break has come to you. Because the scripture says, a sudden good break can turn your life around. And in the next one week, before the end of this month, a sudden good break is going to come to you that has turned every situation and that particular one of your life around in the mighty name of Jesus. But you have to begin to walk in joy. Take that sickness of your heart. Take it to God in prayer and ask him to heal you. Ask him to help you. Let him let you, let him teach you how to forgive. For some, it might be unforgiveness. Because there, is legitimate, there are legitimate wounds. Let him teach you how to forgive. The grace that could have been upon Stephen. And they were stoning him. And Stephen could say, Father, don't count this sin against them. It's not naturally supernatural. 
the grace that could have been upon Jesus. And Jesus said, don't forgive them about the Jesus say his own. Don't let this sin, can you consider Jesus to forgive? People that he sinned and he healed their child. We read those things, I know it cannot be natural. Because there are some things that people do to you. If you say, motto should jam them. Even the angel will say, maybe. But our culture is a culture of love. Love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. The greatest test is the love test. And when we pass the love test, the church is ready to arise. Thank you and God bless you.